was a time of a preacher when a story begun. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Ronnie Garrett Show. Is there any static? We need to know that. Is there static? Is it, is it muffled sound? Is it, is it clear? Is it clean? We need to know. So you can tell us right now. We'll take the first five minutes to be quiet. And, and we're going to wait on you to tell us whether the audio is good. <laughs> We hope I it didn't is. last long. I we know. hope it is. We hope. We it hope. Is. Oh, yeah, we we do hope it's good. I mean, but we are we are using some high tech, superior technology, but it doesn't always translate without the right adapters. Right. And uh, we're gonna make sure that we're good. Hey, I'm. I see a little. You know. Hey, thumbs up. So maybe we can. Hey, I'll send a bunch of those. So boom, 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 boom. Let's see if we get some. Uh, Good audio on those. Oh, yep. No, we have, no we have thumbs a thumbs up. We have a crying face. I think that, that was me. It was me. It was me. I apologize. <laughs> it was me. Peggy says it's great. Thank you, Peggy. Leanne Black says Thank it sounds you all. good. All right. We're on our way. Gary sends nerd nerdy glasses. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Love it. What are you trying to say, Gary? That's like my favorite little emoji is the, is the <laughs> glasses and the buck teeth thing, the nerd one. I love that. My most used emoji is the laughing face. Mine too. Because I'm hilarious. You are. <laughs> hey, Jane, Faye, David. Wow. I know. It's quite good, the crew it tonight. Seems, it seems, hey, good from Michigan. It, it seems like we're going to have a good good crowd tonight. We're going to let y'all gather. and uh, We're here at, at Garrett's house this evening. Welcome to Mikasa. Where you're here alone. That means my house. Of course. And you're here... Uh, a la solo. Yes, with a, a whining basset hound in the other room and uh, just a lovely little lab mix who doesn't care about anything besides laying around all day. But it's, there, yeah, it's Ripley, Ripley and Rita. And Ripley is the lab who just wants to... Uh, in fact, we had to kind of beat him back from the table because he wants to be writing our stuff. Yeah, writing your stuff. And, and the basset hound is very anxious. Yes, and you may is. hear her... Whining in the other room on occasion, but that's okay. I, I begged. Yeah, she. I begged Garrett not to take the hose to her. So. <laughs> not again. And <laughs> <laughs> not again. I just, I just think of silence of the lamb. Oh, oh no. leave that alone. You're gonna get the hose. <laughs> it's, uh, gonna, it's gonna get the hose again. Yeah. So it's been. Uh, we're, we're here because this is. Uh, some of you may or may not know. In the <clears> midst of everything we've had going on. With Cindy's dad passing yeah. and big giant birthdays and teenage boys turn young men who are now scattered in service to their country all over North America, we have uh, sold our house and the house that we're going to move into is not ready yet. I know exactly how you that know goes. how that goes. I know how that goes. It's so, a fun. It's so a fun adventure. We're gonna have to move twice. We're moving to a little apartment. We'll, we'll be there for the balance of this year and probably into the early part of next year because no construction schedule is ever on time. Nope. So uh, it's a little crazy, and it was just better to come here tonight because you do not want to see 13 Melody Lane right now. It's a, I, I kind of want to. I mean, I do, but... Yeah, but we don't want folks here to watch it. <laughs> right. To see it, so. Yeah, so welcome to my house. I like it. I like it. I like it. You know, it's kind of a bachelor pad tonight. It is. Good dogs and dudes, and the, ba- and the <laughs> baseball dogs. the baseball game is going to be on here sh- soon. <clears throat> so uh, the Braves aren't playing, and your Mariners um, aren't playing. They they'll never make it. Yeah. Probably not in my lifetime. It's unfortunate. But, but you, the beloved listeners and watchers, you're out there tonight, and we're glad you're here. And uh, we have uh, an interesting topic. This always troubles me that when one of my own books 
is on Garrett's talking list tonight. It's a little scary. But uh, we're not, we are going to talk a little bit about heaven because right, right, right. heaven was the, the, the subject on Sunday. And uh, we were going to talk about forgiveness last week. And if folks have, have continuing questions about that, here are my notes from last week. But we're moving on to heaven this week because it seems so appropriate. You know, I had some of the greatest uh, feedback Sunday after the two talks and then actually three talks, two talks live and then one talk streamed from folks who had had some similar experiences with loved ones as they, as right. they yeah. come near the end of their, end of their life uh, of waiting on a person to arrive at the hospital before they let go. Mm -hmm. uh, another who had a family member speak of a, of a child she had lost 60, 65 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And at the end of her life, she speaks of that child, you know. Right. And uh, an, another story about uh, a person who comes to the end of, the, end of their life and, and, and brings up a, a buddy from World War II. Hmm. that had died in the war and, and talked about that at the end. So they just, you know, the, I, said it, I said it Sunday that uh, uh, the mind, the soul, I guess is the Christian word we use, the Western word we use, <clears throat> it's an amazing thing. What mm -hmm. it retains, what it holds. And when you get to a point in the dying process, and this is, this is probably a, a pretty good illustration of how to live your life, when you get to a point that all of your defenses are getting stripped away, you know, physically you're stripped away, emotionally you're stripped away, mm -hmm. there's nothing left to prove, there's nothing left to, 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 uh, to, to protect, you're just there in the rawness of being a human being, that deep stuff of the heart and soul comes out. You know, yeah. and it'd probably be better if we lived like that more often, waiting but we're such protective creatures, you know. We're always hiding behind our, our stuff. Yeah. yeah. Stuff. So, hey, Judy Skinner. Hey, Nick. Nick. Kathy Marika. Ken Vines. Uh, Carolyn Welch. Bridget Bergwall. Good to see all of y'all tonight. And if you have questions or comments or things you just want to add, please, please do that. Don't, don't make Garrett and I just sit here and talk to ourselves. <laughs> we, we, we have a good we, time doing that. We have a good time, but we get to talk regularly. You know, I, now that he's moved to the port, now that he's up here on the above the above the bridge, eight. you know. So I have to tell. Hey, uh, Sarah Brunson. Uh, Nick mentioned the coffee mugs, and I was just telling you. Oh, about did this. he? Yeah, yeah. He said cool coffee mugs. Nick, these are actually uh, one of my favorite things to do whenever I visit a country is to pick up a coffee mug. So we have Honduras here and El Salvador here. Uh, so yeah, I collect I like I collect coffee mugs from wherever I visit, except for Israel. That's the one place I forgot to get a coffee mug from. What's well, a remedy well, actually, that? I I guess Mexico is another, but what's well, a remedy that? Yeah, we will. We we'll have to go there sometime just so I could get a mug. So you you got you got you got printed off paper over there about heaven and stuff, and so yeah, bring it on, bring it on. Oh. Because you sent me a text today. It was this like. The introduction to a book. <laughs> well, that was that was a, that was kind of like a, a secondary thought, um, you know, because I spent a little bit of time just kind of uh, watching interviews with people talking about heaven, and and you know, along with heaven, you know, you always have the question about hell too. But you know, we we've, we've covered that. One. We've covered that. <laughs> you oh know, hell no! We left it's heaven. Yes, we left hell behind, yeah. and we are now moving on. <clears throat> But, you know, I, I spent a considerable amount of time today just kind of perusing through books and stuff. And, and you know, the topic of yours comes up. You know, which, which one? There you go. Yeah. How far right. is heaven? <laughs> Rediscovering the kingdom of God in the here and now. And you, you kind of touched upon it a little bit on Sunday mm -hmm. where you're talking about, um, you know, specifically the Lord's Prayer. Part of that, you know, has to do with bringing heaven here. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I know that's part, partially in this book. And this is available on Amazon and Kindle. <laughs> I don't know the price. It doesn't. It I don't doesn't know. Probably fifteen dollars. I don't know. Five dollars. Fifteen. Whoever wants to know. buy it, five. No. <laughs> but no. Um, no. But something that's, like this one, I think, is with Whiff and Stock. Yeah. 
Whiff and Stark have this. So it's Whiff and Stark? Whiff and Stark. So I think it's uh, $15, $16. And you can get it at Whip, Whip, W-I-P-F, Whiff and Stock Publishers or Amazon or wherever. Fine books if you want to. <laughs> if you want to. But no, it, uh, some of the questions kind of revolve around um, you writing this book. Um, you know, because in, in traditional churches, you know, heaven is... I have to say, my, my, yeah. my sister-in-law, Amy cooper Pulowski just showed up to watch, so I have to tip my hat to her. Welcome. Well, can, and Amy, Welcome. if you're still there, God love you. <clears throat> my sister-in-law has been with my mother-in-law, the primary caregiver for my father-in-law mm-hmm. over these years. She's a nurse. Yeah, she, yeah. She's a, she's a nurse in the NICU, so... so I remember you, you, know, you told me. About I mean, yeah. you've had babies in the in the in the NICU in the <coughs> in the intensive care unit for preemies, and yeah. so she's done that work for years. And and uh, her husband Doug, who is a prince, I love Doug Pulowski. He's a good golfer too, isn't he? You don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk. Doug's about respiratory that. therapist, and they're just fantastic. He just people. whooped us. So, is what he did yeah, he right did. Now. He whipped whipped us whipped us bad. <clears> so. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Oh, no. Uh, uh, I don't remember where it was. <laughs> I, I can't um, No, 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 no. So in, in traditional traditional church, uh, we have this uh, almost uh, tainted view of, of what heaven is, who it's for, how we get there, what happens. You know, there's so much, so many layers to it of the afterlife and what to expect, what to anticipate, how it's going to play out that, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting whenever you bring up a different idea or a different take or a different teaching on Jesus's teachings and some of his uh, parables that aren't necessarily speaking of you know what we would think he's te- mm-hmm. you know, teaching. And you talk a little bit about that in the book. But uh, the first question is what uh, what drove you to write this particular book? What was it um, that was ruminating in your mind, in your heart that said you know this idea, this topic of not not necessarily eternal life heaven paradise but the and, idea of and, heaven and, here now. and i certainly believe in eternal <coughs> life uh that's good <laughs> yeah i certainly believe in eternal life you know th- this <coughs> book is appropriate we're drinking out of these mugs this book really had its had its genesis in a lot of different mission trips over the mm. years makes sense yeah going to places like el salvador honduras <coughs> guatemala uh what, what do they call it, the Central American Triangle, those, all the, those more poverty-stricken countries that have been over-colonized to the point of just almost extinction of their own culture. Mm-hmm. And the white, middle-class, Protestant approach is to go down there and, and lend a hand mm-hmm. and, and, and sometimes show them how to do... Uh, to do church properly, uh, properly, and sometimes it's to go to you know these these poor suffering folks. We have to right. alleviate their. We suffering. have to bring salvation. We have to bring salvation. All of these things, preach the gospel yeah. to them because they they because they don't know anything, you know. And and it's really a, a position of superiority speaking down to which is a, a colonial mindset mm-hmm. that Central America has suffered from for five hundred years. Uh, and going to these places, you learn that the people are not ignorant. Mm-hmm. They're poor, poor for reasons mm-hmm. well beyond uh, their ability yeah, to respond. Yeah. Poor generationally, not just five or six generations for centuries. Uh, Central America, Central America was a wealthy uh, portion of the world till the Spaniards took everything away. Mm-hmm. They literally sucked the land dry. They just rang it out. Right. And when all the resources were gone, you know, the mid 1800s, early 1900s, they left. Mm-hmm. And you cannot colonize a group of people for centuries and then expect them to find self sufficiency in 50, 60 years. Right. When they don't have the resources or the leadership. The eldership, the wisdom, all those things that are needed to quote have Western democracy. So going into those regions, and you see this 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 horrific poverty and abuse. And and granted, we have 
these same elements in North America, in our own country, mm-hmm. in inner cities, in in the Mississippi Delta, in Appalachia, and in uh, Native American reservations. Right. We, oh, we yeah. have the exact yeah. same thing that's happened over the years. <clears throat> it's mitigated somewhat by the fact that we're a wealthier country. But going into these areas, I was sitting in a church in Central America, and the pastor was preaching, and it was a it was an English speaking church. Uh, I haven't gone back to that church, not because oh, I like to go to to yeah, native yeah, like to, native like speakers, which is check out different restaurants. Oh yeah, and a native a native yeah. preacher in in a native church in Central America is very unlike uh, what we do. Mm-hmm. It, it's fiery. It's very Pentecostal. It's it's uh, very indigenous. You know, uh, oftentimes it's female led. Uh, it it has a it has a you look at it and you're like, oh, this is kind of chaotic. This is wild, but not to them. It's just an expression of the culture. It's a beautiful thing. It's, right. It's and it's multiple languages are used sometimes. But I was I was in this church where English is primarily a church for Westerners, not just Americans, but Europeans, people that worked at embassies in Central America and all this stuff. So this preacher is preaching that particular day, and and he basically preached the sermon that I've, I had heard my entire life, but I'd never heard it in the in, in that in that context mm. that some of what I said Sunday we've got to get people saved so we can get out of here mm. yeah and yeah. I'd heard that my whole life and in that environment I heard it differently I mean it was like and here's why I heard it differently Gary I could I looked out the window of the church while he's saying these things and you could see three things immediately. You could see the San Salvador uh, volcano, the mountain, which is just gloriously beautiful. Right. And you could look out over the city and see all the slums. Mm-hmm. And you could see gang graffiti painted on walls. That was my view as I looked out that window. And, and sitting there, I thought... This can't be it. I mean, this can't. The, the, what does what does that message say to a twenty five year old Salvadoran woman in the slums with three children and living on a dollar a day? Right. You know. So you go back to where do you where do I go back to when when I'm wrestling with things? I go back to Jesus. I started rereading the prob- the uh, parables, and every every chapter in that book focuses on a parable of right. Jesus, where he talks about the kingdom of heaven, and perpetually, over and over again, as he talks about heaven, as Jesus talks about heaven, he talks about it as a movement of God's reign and rule come to earth. Now that doesn't negate a final state. Uh, by, by any means. But Jesus' obsession is that the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now. Not the kingdom will come, the kingdom is later. Right, right. Uh, and, and and for all those who get it, and all those who are on the inside scoop of what this is all about, they're going to be okay. But for everybody else. Yeah. that That's the teaching that a lot of churches go for. Yeah. And, and do. Well, and, it's a, and it hurts it, a lot of people. It does, and it's very much an in-out culture. We're yeah. in, you are out. Uh, and, and well, in your book, you said, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, you're saying that the kingdom of heaven is good news and uh, it's not just an evacuation plan to rescue people. No, and but, I, yeah, yeah I the mean, rescue is, <clears throat> and, and this is not some sort of, sort of social utopia I'm talking about, because the kingdom of God. Wherever God's reign of love and justice exists, wherever love and justice reigns, God's God's rule has come. Uh, and, and I would say wherever people that are on the margins, whether they be poor or because of their gender or because, you know, all those, as you've done to the least of me, list that Jesus gives in Matthew 25, which is the end of a parable mm. about the kingdom of God. 
we have to bring those on the edge to the center. That's what Jesus is talking about. Recenter those that are classically pushed out onto the margin. How do you bring the sick? How do you bring the imprisoned? How do you bring the thirsty, the hungry, the naked, the poor back to the center of love and justice and service? That becomes kingdom on earth. Now, that's, that, that cannot be accomplished by human government mm-hmm. because there's too much greed. Right. There's yeah. too much power to, to seize. It has to be a genuinely uh, spiritual movement. Now, it, might, it, might, it has practical implications in the world for sure, but it has to be motivated not from a place of if we could just be in charge, then we could make this happen. That is, that is Constantinian thinking. That's, that's dangerous thinking. Mm-hmm. It's not about being in charge so that we can accomplish God's ends. Right. That always gets the church in trouble. It's about sacrificial service for the least of these to bring them to the center and to be a prophetic voice to the culture around us to say uh, black lives matter, immigrants matter, uh, poor people matter. Mm-hmm. All, everyone that's pushed out. Go read these, go read these parables. Not, not in this book, but in this book. And you find, that's a Bible. Uh, if you haven't. And, and what you find is that Jesus' <clears throat> quote, heroes in all of those stories are people that no one in his day and time would ever make heroes. He's bringing those on the edge to the center. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so my next question is, uh, I think you've, you've already done this first part, which is given a little bit of an overview of the book, but what... What is uh, a takeaway that you think the reader would, would walk away with if they picked up this book and read it? You know, what, what is your, your main emphasis in this? I would want them to, 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 to see that you don't just wait for the heaven that will be. Mm-hmm. The, the, the reign of God's love and justice, the reign of heaven exists here. We live like heaven has already arrived. That's what. That's the takeaway. Now, uh, in that sense, I don't think this is in the book, but I could. I've explained it this way in the past. Imagine, you know, that we got enough movies now that we can see this. Imagine there's a time traveler, whether it's Marty McFly or Arnold Schwarzenegger. It doesn't matter. And they go into the future and they see what the future will be. They come back. And with that knowledge, they live differently. Right. And what they do in the present is then try to dig in and bring the present to that possible and that future that is emerging. Does that make Mm. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as redeemed people as followers of Christ what we're saying is this we know that all will be made well and all manner of things will be made well we know that love and justice and restoration and peace and reconciliation is coming because we've seen that future that's what Jesus was talking about that's what Paul articulated it's what John the revelator articulated. So we take that knowledge that the kingdom is here and now and will finally ultimately be consummated and we come back into this living time and we dig in here and say, we know where this whole thing is going. Come on. It looks like this. We can go ahead and start living like that now. Right. So That's the takeaway. So how big of a shift is it to... To take that perspective from the traditional. Oh, it's teaching. massive. I think. And, I, and then, and then, how do we, how do we, how do we get there? I think, I think, you know, in in evangelism, <clears throat> for example, in evangelism being sharing the gospel with others, it's always about the escape pod, mm-hmm. right. or or hell avoidance, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that that's really um, short sighted. I'm not making light of it I'm saying that 
God, there's more than that, you know. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's about what is gained. It's about. It's about. Do you, I would rather say. <clears throat> do you, not rather than saying, "Would you like to avoid hell?" What well, everybody wants to avoid hell. I would rather say, "Wouldn't it be great to live in a world where things are as they should be?" Mm-hmm. That is what Jesus was talking about. So that shift is, is, is huge because it redirects your energies. You dig in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you still get discouraged. You still try to figure out what it all means and how it works itself out. But you begin to realize that as I become a more loving person, a more supportive person, person to my neighbors as I learn what it means to love God and love my neighbor as I act and attempt to live out the life I have as Jesus lived it out that what what begins to take place is I am participating in something much larger than myself right it, yeah the, so the, the the thought is I mean what does that what does that look like um, you know when we talk about bringing bringing heaven to earth and you know, and you do a really good job in, in the book. And like I said, it's been four years since I've read it, but I remember snippets of it, of talking about you know, it's, you know, uh, for instance, the parable of the hidden treasure. That heaven is this this thing that if we look at it as this gift of here and now, uh, it completely alters the way we live. It completely changes how we live, how we love. So it, it brings to mind like, what does this look like exactly? What does it look like to bring heaven here now if it's this attainable thing that we give everything for? So tangibly, oh, tangibly, tangibly, think, what do we Tangibly, do? it means, <clears throat> speaking to my own experience this week, tangibly, it means when a loved one dies, the death is not the end. Mm-hmm. You go on. Not, not with the stoic sense of, well, it's not for us to wonder why but it's only us for to do and die not that it's the sense of things will be made right so i can go on Uh, when we observe grinding debilitating poverty we don't sit back and say if them people would just work for a living come on now there's some people who need to work for a living okay (laughs) Granted, but you talk when we when we're talking about poor children, when we're talking about homeless teenagers, when we're talking about women who have lived under the threat of violence of their partner. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not the gospel. That's social work. That's the gospel to enter into those situations and to alleviate suffering. Right. Uh, and that's, as strange as it sounds, that is a real disconnect that I had uh, in the churches in my formation. I, not that they intentionally did it. It was just sort of this lack of, they had their theology and it dictated how they saw the world. That their ambition was to escape the planet. Yeah, uh, I know exactly. Their know ambition exactly. was not to, not to uh Alleviates, and and I want to make sure that I, that I'm not coming across again is like this is a social program that you know all we have to do is you know every, everybody gets a basic standard of living and a turkey in every pot and everybody you know gets free this or free that. That's not what I'm saying. You know, people confuse that a lot of times. Oh, you're one of them social justice warriors, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means. Uh, is that a, is that a I don't bad know thing? what that means anymore. I don't know. I don't know. I've been called that in in the last is couple it, years. Is I don't know what it means. Is it bad to be concerned <laughs> about the well being? But is it is it bad to be concerned about justice arriving to your society? Uh, you know. So, Apparently, so, so. so so there's that piece. The other piece <clears> is you know think about it in in uh, in uh, the justice system. Think about yeah. the work of. Uh, the Equal, Equal Justice Initiative, mm-hmm. Brian Stevenson oh, yeah. in Montgomery, Alabama, who works to defend... What was that movie? Uh, Just Mercy. Just Mercy's oh, book as well. so good. So, uh, so good. Who is working to defend wrongly convicted people. What did Jesus say? As you do the least of these, 
when I was in prison, you visited me. Mm-hmm. Now, if you were to sit down with Brian Stevenson in this exact setting, he would tell you that the gospel pushes him to do the work he has done over all these years. Hmm. It's not just some legal uh, uh, effort that he's involved in. It's this is what Jesus has called me to do on behalf yes. of 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 someone who who does not have the power themselves right. to do it. Uh, and, and you know, feeding the hungry in the name of Christ becomes the kingdom of God come to earth. The alleviation of suffering, the defending of the of the orphan and the and the widow, which mm-hmm. the prophets talked about all the time. You know, we can, and we're really good, in, and I probably shouldn't even get into this in late October, early November. We, we politicize helping people. Oh, for the love oh, of right. God. Right? You know? <laughs> I'm oh, not I know talking oh, about man. where the government spends your money. I'm talking about the attitude and the position we take toward the weak. And if we are not on the side of the hungry, thirsty, naked, imprisoned, the orphan, the immigrant, the, the, the widow, the suffering, if we're not on their side, it's hard to say we're on the side of heaven. It's really yeah. hard to say that. And, that and to that point, and, and to that effect, I've I've seen um, good-hearted people, people I would consider, um, you know, uh, they, they've been lifelong Christians. They're Christians. They're, they're, they're yeah. in the church. And, and just so everybody's aware, I'm I'm not talking about any particular person that's a part of our gathering. Yes, he is. I, I, I'm talking about a former experience where <laughs> I'm talking about a former experience where um, I see these people post these things on Facebook. Oh, now and, you've done it. And and it's it's just so anti Jesus that they show up on Sunday, they they bring their kids to church. I was their youth pastor, and then they go back and talk about you know. And I'm not going to dive into this, but policies and, yeah. and why and why you know and and this is exactly what you what you you know we're diving into is this idea of the immigrant, the those in prison, the poor, and their their stance on it was so anti Jesus. I'm going, are you even are you even following the same Jesus of of this Bible, or well, is it is your interpretation? And that's that's another question I have is why is our application and understanding of Jesus is Teaching so far off in, in too many churches in, in Be- the because States. our understanding of Jesus is united with power. It always comes down to that. We cannot conceive of a church dislocated from power because our churches have always been the center of the town square, mm-hmm. and we are living in a rapidly changing environment where that is no longer the case. <clears throat> uh, and we don't know how to speak from a place of being marginal, being marginalized ourselves. Right. <laughs> you know, when you haven't taken the side of the marginalized, and then you end up being a part of a marginalized group, you don't know how to act. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have. Now I'm going to start preaching. Let, hold on, let me get the solo camera on. <laughs> we have You are free to preach. <laughs> we have <clears throat> prioritized respectability. We have made Christianity in North America synonymous with upper middle class citizenship we have sidelined the hard teachings of Jesus about how we treat others for some sort of doctrinal integrity Mm. and I said it Sunday I'll say it even more forcefully here it is really difficult 
to give a damn about this world when your ambition is to leave it behind and see it wash down the drain. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole theology that teaches that. Oh, right. There, right there's right. a Escapism. leading. There is a leading Protestant voice in North America just this week who said, and I quote, the world was made to be disposable. Get over it. Hmm. Where does that lead? Lead you, right? We're just, we're we're, and he wasn't just talking about the planet. He's talking about everything it contains. Where does that lead you? Now, do I believe in a new heavens and a new earth? I do. I do. Mm -hmm. I believe that things will be made right. But it grows out of the world we have. Uh, yeah, I saw it. It's, it's just a lot to tell. That, that statement really, really, oh, it winded me. It was like, oh, right. Knocked the breath out of me when I heard it. Yeah, I, <coughs> I'm not intentionally shifting gears here, but I'm, Go ahead. I'm just. Uh, I saw this earlier. I was watching an interview, and they talked about statistically what Americans believe. And you know, this was a, a nine-year-old interview, so at the, it, it, it's probably shifted since then. But they shared that eighty-one percent of Americans believe that there is a heaven, and seventy percent believe that's a real, like, geographical location. Now, I don't. I mean, we have uh, how much time do we have? Twenty minutes? Twenty-ish? I did wear a watch. So um, you got to tell me. Yeah, it's 7.06. Um, yeah, we have 20. 25 minutes, yeah. Yeah, we have 25 minutes. I don't know. Do, do you want to talk about heaven, yeah, heaven yeah. as in... Yeah, I'll quit preaching and get on to <coughs> kind of more of the topic. So, yeah, 70% 70, 70 believe geographical real location. Um, thoughts. N.T. Wright says, <coughs> you're going to die and go to heaven, but it's not the end of the world. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love it. You're going to die and go to heaven, but it's not the end of the world. What does he mean by that? He means that we only have a glimpse of the afterlife. Right. <laughs> so that there is so much that we often read into the scriptures and we bring in from other traditions. It's the human desire. Uh, but the, the picture we have that's the clearest is resurrection. The risen Christ, if there, you know, if there is a heaven, the risen Christ is where it begins. Mm. And because he is risen, we too can rise. To be absent from this body is to be present with Christ. All those great uh, uh, phrases. So if you ask me you know, today, what is, what is that geographical location? Where is heaven? <laughs> where is heaven? Uh, I, I can't say where the geographical location is. Certainly, from what we, <laughs> certainly from what even we know about our universe, oh, is right. that it's not in the spatial dimensions of what we've known. You know, well, heaven's up. Well, up depending on where. Am I living in Australia with Gary Hedges, or am I living in North America? Gary. When we just start talking about up, you know, we're talking about out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul talked about the th the third heaven, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably a good metaphor for it. The first heaven being the atmosphere, the second heaven being yeah the universe, universe and, and then the third heaven being that place where God is. Um, now, do I believe in a geographical point where heaven exists? Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. <laughs> It used to be. <coughs> it used to. <laughs> we like to have fun during yeah, the serious do, conversations. Uh, no, I can't say that. That uh, there it is on the map. It, 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 because it transcends. You know, it's tra it transcends we our language. Right. We can't allow speculation to become dogma. It, it, well said. <laughs> I mean, that, that speculation cannot become dogma be, because it's all. It, in, it, I said it in passing the other day as we were walking to our car after lunch. Like, it's so so much of it speculative. Um, 
we have scripture. Scripture tells us bits and pieces, but it doesn't it doesn't unveil it. And I we, if you and go, I like that because yeah, it go, allows go room for way, mystery. Go all the way back to the Apostles' Creed. The in the Apostles' Creed, don't say that too loud. Alexa might turn on the movie Creed. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> he was playing Creed the band earlier, and I wanted to leave. Uh, even in the Can apostles, you take me in the Apostles' Creed, which which is the earliest confession of faith, <clears throat> probably even before, well, certainly before the New Testament is even finalized and put together, mm-hmm. they didn't give specifics about the afterlife. Right, right. That that was another. They question only I had. they only said that you know that Christ is risen from the dead, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. And bring everything essentially to its appropriate conclusion. That's enough for me, right? It, That's enough for me. In in you know, uh, I always, whenever I think about this topic, I, you know, uh, eternal life and uh, that kind of thing, I always think back to the conversation we had driving up to Birmingham, where you you said something that I, I'd never been told or taught in, in uh, school or anything. What did I, I say? <clears throat> well, you just said uh, you know, in the first century Jewish tradition, they never really thought of eternity or eternal life or life everlasting it wasn't about that it was about life here now mm-hmm. which was just a really interesting you know i did say that i think thought it sounds like something i would say it's true uh, <clears throat> so where did where did this idea of of eternal life get hijacked into like the greek all all we think about plato is there versus you know for them it was we have this now let's do it plato the, uh, like the not the, the not form, the, not Plato P L A T O the kind you make the mistakes. Greek philosophers said that for the godly they would transcend this world to Elysium, <clears throat> which was due west from Greece, and that can't be true because due west of Greece is New Jersey. Well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, I'm just being facetious, uh, but. But again, they were speaking, I think, of, of a transcendent state. Uh-huh. And it was Plato who believed that the soul, he's one of the first, who really talked about the soul being eternal. Mm-hmm. The body, not so much. The body fades, the soul is eternal. That's not what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 at all. What does he say? He says... I tell you a mystery, shall the corruptible inherit incorruptibility? No. His view was that body and soul, the whole person, would be resurrected and transformed and made fit for eternity. Not this disembodied soul floating around out there somewhere, but that because of the resurrection of Christ, the kind of life, a transformed body and spirit would be ours as well. Hmm. That's a completely different view, even than most Christians view today. Because most Christians view today that, you know, I get put in the ground or cremated or what have you, and my soul goes to heaven to be with God, and which I don't disagree with, but that there's the soul is more important than the actual self. That's very Greek. Mm. That's not very biblical in the sense of the Jewish context. Right, right. Because the Jewish context, as Paul talked about <clears throat> Jesus, was about resurrection. Mm. So even in, in memorial services and funerals that I do and have done for the last decade, a lot of my language has changed. It's subtle, but it has changed. I do talk about heaven. And my favorite is, is, is to speak of Peter Marshalls, who was the late uh, chaplain of the Senate. And he gave the greatest example uh, that I've ever heard when we begin to talk about a new world and we talk about heaven. <clears throat> he said, imagine if I could speak to you while you were in utero and you're there in the womb, and in that womb, you are warm and safe and comfortable, 
And I tell you, there is a world beyond this world that you cannot even begin to imagine. A world where there are colors. The grass is green. The sky is blue. The space around you is almost infinite. People move about walking on their legs. Uh, you breathe oxygen instead of amniotic fluid. If I could speak to you and say that to you while you were in the womb, you would say, bullshit, this is all there is. This is all there is. I'm happy here, and when this is over, it's over. But then one day, you experience more pain than you've ever experienced in your life. And your world begins to collapse, and you are convulsed and driven out of the world, that, the only world you had ever known. Well, what has just happened? Mm -hmm. You haven't died. You've been born into the real world. Mm -hmm. That's Peter Marshall's example, and it's absolutely beautiful. We, we have a question on here. Uh, Peggy, what about people who say they have died and describe heaven? I don't doubt it. I've been with a lot of people who've died. I've seen some crazy things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In a good way. <clears throat> I've seen what I think people are glimpsing of, of whatever weight. I'm, I'm not denying any of that. It's I'm saying this. I'm saying that heaven is is here and now and there and then. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the kingdom of God is present and the kingdom of God will ultimately come. I'm yeah. saying I'm trying to get my arms around all of that and that human experience and scripture itself points to a restoration beyond this world that is so profound that any time it's taken up in Scripture to be described, we're left with more question marks than answers. Mm. It's just that profound. Right. And, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, when, you, when you hear, watch, or listen to some of these stories, a lot of them are, are similar in thought and in, in, in experience for people who have... <clears throat> You know, been in the hospital and they've coded, and then they come back to oh, tell yeah. you the story, and they're they're all very much similar in the same vein of thought in in what they experienced, what they saw, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like you, where where it's yeah, I, I I don't have any doubt that there something could have happened, and you know, I leave a lot of room for mystery. Like, yeah, well, that's that's the that's the thing about all this too. With my father-in-law this past week. <clears throat> saw Gumbo the dog down in the woods and went after him to see what he was doing. Right. Mm. Now, the hardcore religionist says, there's no do there are no dogs in heaven, which if you say that to me, I don't want to listen to anything else you've got to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there got to be dogs in heaven. Are you kidding me? If there's mosquitoes, I'm... I'm yeah, if there's mosquitoes, then yeah, what we're saying. Revelation but, says the gate's open, so if there's mosquitoes, I'm... The gates I'm are open. Room. The gates are open. When he saw when he, he saw Gumbo down in the woods, and he I didn't mention this Sunday, but he, he spoke of his, to me and Cindy, he spoke of his twin brother who died of pneumonia hmm. in 1937, 38, when he was just a, a baby boy, and he spoke wow. of Bryce. And we didn't name Bryce after that <clears throat> brother, but isn't it kind of this thing of providence that we have a Bryce? Ronald, Bryce Ronald Cooper, who... They, you know, they both were sick. Ronald died. George lived, and there near the end, who does he speak of? Right. Where does that come from? And, and of course, you can say maybe from a scientific perspective, oh, that just comes from suppressed blah blah blah. Maybe, but come on, it is consistent across death experiences yeah. that people gravitate toward the unanswered question, toward the loved one, toward that place of complete and total acceptance. That's a human experience. It's not, uh, it, it, it's not just conjecture. And, and to say, well, that's just, you know, you can't, I'm not talking about trusting it, but I am talking about respecting it and honoring it. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's human experience. It's, it's, it's real. Because if it's your experience, Garrett McHugh, 
it's real. If you experienced it, you would have to say it was real to me. There'd be right. no way yeah. around it. And it, it, here's an interesting thought too: is the closer the the closer we get to embracing this idea that in this life here and now we can experience heaven here, heaven now, and we tap into that with love, gratitude, compassion, generosity, forgiveness. Uh, you know, really taking these things on, we brush up against the reality of heaven through our experiences. You know, when we hear a good song or when we hear, uh, mm-hmm. you know, when Samuel was born and you're waiting, they, you're, they deliver him and you're waiting for that. that oh first my breath. God, isn't that something? But then, you know, I'm getting chills thinking I know about it. I but, know it, I've been there. But that's the reality of heaven, that there's, there's this amazing gift that when we can... You know, tap into those different things that we're called to do in the first place. We start brushing up against the reality of heaven. We experience things that are unexplainable. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it it's like if if I were to tell you <clears throat> prior to being married and having kids, like how much joy I would experience, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't tell you what that meant until right. I went through it. And that's that's exactly what we're talking about. Is um, you know. There's so much more that we ought to be living for um, when we take the words of Jesus seriously, when we when we read it and, and go, he calls me to love. How can I do that better? When when he talks about compassion and loving the the outcasts, those on the outskirts of society, you know, talking about El Salvador, uh, I think about what uh, uh, Susios is doing. Mm-hmm. That's it. Rescuing, rescuing kids that have been cast aside <clears throat> serving uh, serving the homeless mm-hmm. bringing the meals night after night in well, all types of weather th- think about what you've just said <clears throat> too and, th- and this is really where I'm at too there is no any separation that we make between earth and heaven is artificial mm-hmm. we're already there in the sense that God is among us Christ lives within us we are already there now does that mean i may be deprived of a loved one's presence for a period of time yeah is it agonizing yeah absolutely you've you've lost a child <clears throat> mm-hmm. i have not had that experience i don't ever want that experience uh it's new to cindy she's lost a father i don't know that experience i know what it's like to lose them the person that was most important to me, you know, when mm-hmm. my grandmother died. Mm-hmm. Do I think about her? I do. Do I think she's in heaven? Absolutely. Does she remain with me in my heart and in my spirit? Absolutely. You just don't draw this line and say, this is here and that's there. It's all yeah. now. Yeah. It's all now. Uh. And, it, and you know, if, if that's how we view life, you know, it's going to be agonizing. If we oh. have the separation of, of earth and heaven in this whole escapism, as you say, like waiting for the escape pod or Jesus to return or, you know, for us to be carried away or swift away through death and leave this all behind. And we don't ever live for the heaven on earth now. It's agonizing. Mm-hmm. It, it's painful. I mean, because what else is there? If all we're doing is just waiting and biding our time, like... The first, the first sermon that Jesus preached, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. Mm-hmm. That's his first sermon. Yep. And then his last words to his disciples are, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Well, those are the bookmarks. It's here, it's now, and it continues To whenever the end of the age comes, you know, uh, one of my last thoughts I had too was just if we took this thing seriously, uh, you just you just have to wonder about the impact on the world around us because a large portion of those that are unbelieving or skeptical are that way because of people that are self-proclaimed Christ followers. Because, I mean, if, if we believed heaven is real, if we believe the gospel is real, if, if we believe Jesus is real, <laughs> then, 
then our lives should reflect that in such a way that people around us would be wondering there there's something different about who they are what they believe rather than the way that they talk the way that they post on social media the way that they uh, spend like all these di- all these different things Spend. showcase that what they say and what they do are completely opposing views, mm-hmm. opposing things. And uh, I forgot who it was. You could probably <laughs> you could probably say it, Mister Encyclopedia. Don't say that. <clears throat> but the the greatest cause of atheism is Brennan Manning. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, quote it, quote it. The greatest quote. cause of atheism in the world today is that a watching world watches. Christians say one thing and live a different way. Exactly. That is the greatest That's, cause of atheism in the world today. So if we took this thing to heart, and, and it's not its not even about converting. It's not even about... No. We it's about it. being. It's right. about being. Mm-hmm. Be. And you're not going to be perfect. And here's the great thing. When you're not perfect, admit it. Yeah, we're human. <laughs> we're human. <laughs> Admit it. God, I screwed up. You know, oh, I was wrong. It's, it won't, I'm going to continue screwing up. I, but, because I, I will am. continue to be wrong, but I am pressing on toward the goal. Uh-huh. Uh, I am a child of God. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, man. Anyway, there you go. What what time is it? Uh, we have five minutes. So. Universalism, Ronnie. Oh dear Lord! <laughs> what about it? <clears throat> no, I don't know. I was just. I was okay. just <laughs> Is that one of your questions? Or are no, you just making no. stuff up now? No, you. Know, uh, four minutes now. Shoot. Uh, so I'm running out the clock. Who goes to heaven? Who doesn't? Okay. That was just completely. In off light of everything we've talked about about hell and about heaven and everything else in the last few weeks. If we're already living in this state of grace, then you know the answer. I'll leave that up to the listeners. I don't know where all the journey will take us, but I, but I, I do believe that the love of God is the greatest force in the universe. That is my answer. Oh, so okay. We st- we got have, one more question. We have, well, right. well, we have like three and a half minutes, so. Uh, Jesus, in some of his teachings, almost sounds exclusive. Right. Uh, so, you know, and so earlier I sent you that text where he's like, "I'm the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me." And you know, I kind of gave you like, "I have never thought about it this way. I wonder if this could be, mm-hmm. you know, stuff." But I'm not going to touch upon that. But um, you know, in some of his parables and some of his teachings, he talks about be ready. Uh, yeah. You know, why is the path that leads to destruction and mm-hmm. narrow the path that leads to everlasting right. life? Uh, so, what do we do with that? I mean, if, because we, you and I know that Jesus is not this exclusive person. It's like, you're in, you're out. You're sheep, you're a goat. Right. Uh, but we oftentimes miss the, the real heart of what he's saying. There's a lot of self-exclusion. <clears throat> Self-exclusion. Jesus isn't the one that... that that because he goes out and he gathers people. And, I know, have not and, come to condemn the world. And he's going to renew all things. I it? have come that the world would be saved. Mm. So any condemnation, any judgment that exists, two things. It's not the judgment of Christ that falls on such people. It's the refusal of grace. Mm. And... As we've talked about when we talked about hell, judgment and condemnation can be punitive or redemptive. Hmm. And I believe in the redemptive love of God. That even the harsh things are for the purpose of turning the hearts Hmm. of people to God. Hmm. I have I have one more thought. You keep having I thoughts. Keep having I'm going to cut you off, my... man. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's funny because you know I've 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 been listening to and reading a little bit more of Rob Bell, and you know that. Oh, you heretic! Well, no, I love. Her. It's funny because I, I watched one uh, interview of him where someone was like, "Are you universalist?" And he's like, "No," because he's like, in, in the sense of universalism, it, it believes or it's taught that everybody, everybody goes to heaven. And he's like. 
What about those that refuse? What about those that are, you know, here and now choose to refuse the love of God for one reason or another? I, there's there's a multitude of reasons why people would, but um, couldn't that be the same for after this? You know, is done, that's, and that's, that's where he's like, "I'm not a universal." That's N.T. Wright's position too. Yeah, and uh, I have a lot of respect for N.T. Wright. What's uh, his real name? Nathan. Uh, Nard. Tom is his middle name. I don't know what I can't remember what the N stands for. But New, New Testament. Right? But uh, New Testament, right? He's a British Anglican. Was the Bishop of Durham. Super and, bright. Super bright. You, you may not agree with everything he says, but you better pack your lunch if you're going to fight with him because oh he knows his stuff. Uh, he talks about it in a great <laughs> book. I recommend the book, uh, Surprised by Hope, which is, which is his book about eternity. Uh, he, he, he talks about how to reject the love of God is to become less than human, mm. Which, mm. Is, which is a crazy approach, but he takes it and he talks about how the end of life is that if we can't, if we, if we, if we refuse the love of God, not this hellfire damnation, you better pray the right prayer. Once we are aware of and witness the true love of God, to reject such a thing would be to be less than human. Hmm. It's pretty powerful. Right. Now apply it to the world today. How do atrocities, how do the worst evils exist when we reject basic love for people because mm-hmm. there is no difference between love for people and love for God that's what the scriptures teach us what Jesus has taught right. us that, that's a good point to, to hinge on right there we'll go we'll be <coughs> we'll be done we're here at Garrett's house and we're gonna finish we have I'm exhausted do we have any I mean besides the uh, November 1st do we have any other you make the announcements where's your bathroom Right back this. I had two, uh, right back here. I had two bottles of water and whatever you <clears throat> made me to drink. Yes, here. yes. So I'll be right back. Go ahead. Make your. I'll name. make the announcement and I'll hang up. Uh, oh no, we have. We uh, oh, to the right. To we the right. Everyone can see you too. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> last closing announcement is that on November first, uh, Daylight Savings Day. Right. So keep this in mind. It's going to be Daylight Savings Day. We are going back to one service, in-person service. So November 1st, mark that on your calendar. Also mark that's Daylight Savings Day. So uh, the hour time change is going to uh, mess with you a little bit there. And we will be doing a 9.30 in-person service. Um, And we're doing this uh, because of our virtual audience. Um, We wanna keep the time as, as close to um, consistent uh, what we've been doing uh, lately we want to try and keep it around the same time frame as much as possible so one service November 1st 930 in person uh, 1115 virtually uh, do you have anything you want to say no that's great that's great well, time, time, time changing and I appreciate so much people behaving during our live services people have been <laughs> They've, oh, kept, it's been they've kept distance, crowds have been small, and so we feel safe to go back to one service because we can still do social distancing with all the folks. And the people there. online have been doing great with oh, it, too. I love it. Social distancing love online. It. Thanks, everybody, for everything. Bye. Was a time of a preach when a story begun. She left town.